بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وحبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد الله وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين الغرر الميامين سيما بقية الله في الأرضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وولي أمرنا مهدي هذه الأمة وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة بن الحسن العسكري فداه أرواح العالمين قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وكونوا مع الصادقين آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم We spoke about divine revelation instructions in the holy book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Quran which deal with our demeanor our manners and our etiquette when it comes to dealing with the Holy Prophet of Islam. We mentioned some verses there. And then I spoke about a different category of verses which deal with, uh, they're very closely related to the first category, but quite distinct because they, they instruct us as to our responsibilities and religious obligations towards the Prophet. So while the first set dealt with our moral obligations, the second set deals with our religious obligations and our responsibilities towards the Prophet. Tonight I'd like to, I'd like to talk about a different set of uh, not so much responsibilities or moral obligations, but rather a set of various levels of connection with the Prophet and his Immaculate Household. While the first and the second sets talk about our responsibilities, this one talks about what it means to be a follower of Islam and where each one of us finds themselves with regards to those responsibilities. So ra rather than talking about the responsibilities, as I said, we're talking about our level of connectedness with the Prophet and his household. Because obviously, as people come in different shapes and sizes, they also come with different tastes and preferences. They also come with different attitudes towards different things. They show different reactions. Therefore, and on the same token, people's level of connectedness to the Ahlul Bayt also comes in various different degrees. There is no doubt that the closeness of Salman to the Ahlul Bayt is very different to the closeness of Mahdi al or any other person for that matter. There's no doubt that the connection that Maytham al-Tammar, for instance, enjoyed with his Imam versus mine is very different. There's no doubt that Maqdad ibn al-Aswad al-Kindi's connection was very different from mine. So what are these various degrees? The first is the love and the admiration that we display with regards to the Ahlul Bayt. Al-Hub, to love them. What does it mean to love them? First, it means you enjoy their remembrance. You love to talk about them, mention their stories. And you enjoy to be told of their stories and their fables and their manners and their quotes and their words of wisdom and whatnot. Secondly, it means that you show and express an emotional outpour when it comes to their tragedies. So you enjoy what they enjoy. يَفْرَحُونَ لِفَرَحِنَا وَيَحْزَنُونَ لِحُزْنِنَا 
you also lament at their tragedies. When you hear of their pains, their miseries, and what they went through in this life, you also feel a degree of pain. What else does it mean to love the Ahlul Bayt? It means that you despise their enemies. Those people who hurt them, you obviously harbor no love towards them. To love Musa also means to despise Fir'aun. To love Ibrahim also means to despise Namrud. To love the Prophet also means to despise Abu Jahl. To love the Ahlul Bayt also means to despise their enemies. Again, it's very logical. You don't need a PhD in, in, in rocket science to understand that to love someone also means you despise their enemies. Now, this is something that we all have. We all love the Ahlul Bayt. That's what brings us here. That's what brings us together. That's what allows us to go back year in and year out to listen to the tragedies of the Ahlul Bayt, to mark their celebrations, to celebrate their joyous festivities, because we love them. Now, there are two problems with this basic, bare-bones, minimum level of connection with the Ahlul Bayt, which is the level of love. The first problem is that just as this love was implanted in our hearts by an external agent, and I'll explain what I mean by that, it can also be taken away from us. The benefit of loving the Ahlul Bayt is that you can pretty much guarantee that once the love has been, has been planted and it stays with you until the day you breathe your last, until the day you die, if you maintain that love, you are guaranteed not to be condemned to eternal damnation in fire and the fires of hell. It means that you're on the straight path even though you might be lagging way behind. But it means at least you know what's good for you. You know who your leaders are. You know that you need to imitate and follow and love them and be in their company. That you know, and for that, here's what you get. You will not burn in hell forever. Does that mean that you can burn in hell if you have the love of the Arabian in your heart? The answer is yes, without a doubt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is compassionate, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also just. And God's justice means that everybody pays. Let's not kid ourselves. Everybody pays. We either pay in this world for our crimes and our sins and our transgressions, and if there's way too many of them for us to suffer enough and, and compensate for those crimes, we'll have to pay in the hereafter. Somehow. And trust me, God knows how to punish us. He knows how to purify us. And so the first danger is that if this is all we have in our hearts for the Ahlul Bayt, if it's just sentimental attachment to these holy figures and not much else, this love could be taken away from us. What do I mean by that? The love that you have for the Ahlul Bayt isn't an acquired quality. It's not something that you developed yourself. Why do I say that? You've never seen Imam al-Husayn. You've never seen the Prophet. Allahumma inna amanna bi nabiyika inni amantu bi nabiyika wa lam arah farzuqni yawm al-qiyamati ru'yata the dua says. Oh Allah, we believe in your messenger without having seen him. And so please on the day of judgment allow us to cast our gaze at his mesmerizing beauty. Allow me to see him. Allow me the honor of kissing his hand. Because I've never seen him in my life. The fact that you haven't seen the Ahlul Bayt is interesting because your love towards them is the love of someone who not only has seen another person but who's lived with them all the time. You've never seen Imam al Rada and yet when you go to his visitation in the holy city of Mashhad in Khurasan, you collapse as soon as you cast your eye on the cage surrounding his tomb, you collapse because of the love and the admiration that you have towards the Imam. You've never seen him in your life. 
So clearly, وَجْعَلْ أَفْئِدَةً مِّنَ النَّاسِ Tahwi ilayhim, the Prophet Ibrahim says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he deserted his family, his newborn child and his newly wedded wife, well newly wedded as in, she was his second wife, Hajar, and suddenly, instead of taking her to her honeymoon, he's commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to go to a barren land, a desolate desert place, where there is nothing that grows in the ground, there's no water, there's no vegetation, there are no visitors no one goes through that land. That's how desolate it was. قَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي أَسْكَنْتُ مِنْ ذُرِّيَّةِ بِوَادٍ غَيْرِ ذِي زَرَعَ I have left them here in a land that is barren and desolate. Therefore, here's what I ask in return. فَجْعَلْ أَفْئِدَةً مِنَ النَّاسِ تَهْوِي إِلَيْهِمْ Therefore, make the hearts of certain people sway towards them. It means this love that this affection, this respect, this admiration, this appreciation that we have towards good men and women of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something that God makes happen. Fajal, Jal means God makes it happen. God makes you love Imam al Hussein. He's the one that takes your hand to the doorstep of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. And so the same one that gave you that love could also take it away. What's the proof? The Quranic proof, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the people who sin and have an excess amount of sin. ثُمَّ كَانَ عَاقِبَةَ الَّذِينَ أَسَاءُوا السُّوءَ أَنْ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ And the ultimate result of those who commit sins excessively, أَسَاءُوا السُّوءَ Those who commit sins, ultimately they will turn into people that not only do they reject the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not only do they say that this is all a lie eventually, but what's even more, وَكَانُوا بِهَا يستهزئون. They will also mock the message of God. They will also make a mockery of the words of the Prophet and the Imams. Is this a prospect that you and I could live with? That on our deathbed, imagine, God forbid, We've always, we grew up with the love of the Ahlul Bayt in our hearts. We grew up with, with the name of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi Ali ibn Abi Talib al-Hassan al-Husayn fa'atima the Ahlul Bayt in our hearts. From the day we were born. From the day we were born, and I'm not exaggerating. Somebody once said to me, why do you keep on saying Ya Ali? Why do you say Ya Ali? I said, I'll tell you why we say Ya Ali. And we say it day in and day out, and we say it in every single calamity and every single problem and every time I want to get up I say Ya Ali because my mother gave birth to me while calling out Ya Ali we say Ya Ali because the Prophet kept on saying Ya Ali Aina Sayfi Ali the Prophet would say in the battles Aina Dir'i Ali Aina Habibi Ali where is my sweetheart Ali the Prophet said Ya Ali Ya Ali my mother said Ya Ali my father taught me to say Ya Ali when I was climbing the steps he taught me to say Ya Ali when I went to school he taught me to say Ya Ali when I was learning how to ride a bike and I'll continue to say Ya Ali Ya Ali Ya Ali until the day I surrender my soul to his creator imitating Rasulullah and applying what I've learnt but can you imagine the prospect of being on my deathbed and suddenly finding there is no love whatsoever for Ali ibn Abi Talib? No love for Rasulullah. No love for Fatima al Zahra. Can we live with that? Of course not. So that's the first danger of, of maintaining just this basic level of connection with the Ahlul Bayt. Just the love. The second danger is that no one goes into heaven without being purified, brothers and sisters. People have to go through purgatory. And purgatory isn't a Catholic concept. It's something we believe in as well. Imam Sadiq والسلام, says, Al-Barzakh, Barzakh meaning the bridge that connects this world and the hereafter, this space of time. In this space, people get purified. Their sins have to be cleansed. Now, if you want to clean a dirty foot, you use a pretty rough sponge to clean it. What do you use to cleanse a soul? What kind of soap, what kind of detergent, what exactly do you use to cleanse a sinful, filthy spirit? 
that has been blackened by the filth and dirt of sin, what do you do? You can't exactly use a sponge now, can you? People have to suffer for these sins to be purified, for these souls to be cleansed. And so the danger is, as I mentioned earlier, is that we will have to suffer in this world as well as in the hereafter before we get to go to paradise if all we have in our hearts is the love for the Ahlul Bayt. A lot of people say this, well I love the Ahlul Bayt and that should, be, that should be sufficient. Inshallah it's sufficient ultimately. The question is from now till then what, what's going to happen to me? From now until then. Until the time God, decide, God decides that I will be allowed into heaven. Where will I be? Walakin, listen to this, Amir al-Mu'mineen has a beautiful word. He talks about how he has no attachment whatsoever to the corporeal material world. In any way, shape or form. أَلَا وَإِنَّ إِمَامَكُمْ قَدْ اكْتَفَى مِن دُنْيَاهُ بِطَمْرَيْهِ وَمِن طُعْمِهِ بِقُرْصَيْهِ He says to his governor, he says to him that your leader, your imam, finds it sufficient that all he has in this world in this entire world where he was the emperor of 50 of today's countries. Where he was the leader of an empire that stretched across the globe. He had it all. He had access to everything. And yet he says, your leader, I've heard that you keep going around to different banquets. People invite you to these functions and luncheons and you get treated like a, like a royalty. What you should know, he says to his governor, is that your imam, your leader who is in a better position to enjoy himself. Your imam has found it sufficient that all he has from this petty little pathetic world of yours is two pieces of clothing. Two pieces of clothing. To the extent that one day, a man goes to the Friday prayers of Amir al-Mu'mineen in the mosque of Kufa. He says that his son says, who was obviously much younger, he was with his father, he says that when we went there, I noticed that Amir al-Mu'mini, he didn't know who he was, he says, I don't know who the person was, but I noticed a man giving the sermon while just shaking his dress like so. He kept on shaking it while also giving the sermon. And I wondered why he was doing this. So I said to my father, who is this and why is he doing that? He said, this is Ali ibn Abi Talib, Amir al-Mu'mini. Salatullahi wa salamu and he's doing that because he only has two dresses, two shirts, two pieces of clothing, two articles of clothing. So when one gets dirty, he needs to wash it. And when he washes it, he's got only the other one to wear. If two of them get dirty, then he needs to wash it and put it on while it's still wet. And that's why he's doing this, so he could dry it up while he's giving the sermon in front of, in front of tens of thousands of worshippers. The head of state... The head of state, as far as I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, every single head of state in the world, even in the most democratic systems, has a set budget for their clothes. They have a whole wardrobe of suits and ties and clothes and underwear and everything. Everything's done for them. Why? Because they say this isn't something that he needs to pay from his own pocket because he represents the nation. He represents the state when he goes out to different countries. He, he heads delegations. There are diplomatic protocols to be observed. Not in the country of Ali ibn Abi Talib. No. There are no protocols. The head of state needs to live at the same level of the poorest of all subjects. Of the poorest of the poor. So don't say, I'm a Shia and act like anything but. You want to be a Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib, be like him. My father said this in a speech once addressing members of the government in a certain country. And he said, uh, he said you don't want to be like Ali ibn Abi Talib. Because the minute we mention his name, they say, oh, well, that's unrealistic. That's what, 14 centuries ago? We can't really imitate Ali ibn Abi Talib who lived 14 centuries ago. Well, fine, you can't imitate him. Imitate Gandhi. Imitate someone with a little less attachment to this material world. Or if you want to live like everybody else, at least don't claim that you follow him. Moving on. They say one day, <coughs> I didn't want to mention this, but since we're on the subject, and this is the month attributed to them, you know, 
One day a Jewish man comes to the city of Kufa. He walks in, he goes to the mosque, which was the central arena where everybody gathered and where the uh, leader of the ummah would, would come to lead the prayers and where declarations of war would be made, where treaties of peace would be signed. It was like the central palace. And so he, he goes to the mosque. He sees someone praying there. He goes up to him. The Muslim man says to the Jewish person, he says to him, Who are you? You look like a stranger. You've come from outside the city. He said, Yes, I'm here on some business and uh, I just need to speak to the Khalifa's advisor or the, uh, his secretary or somebody who has authority or somebody who has any relations with him because I need to get this business out of the way. He said to him, would you like to see the Khalifa himself? He said, I, could, I get to see the Khalifa? I get to see the leader of 50 of today's countries? My words, not his. He said, sure. I can take you to him. He said, brilliant, let's go. So he takes him by the hand. He says to him, I'm a Jewish man. I'm here. I'm a stranger. I want to see the Khalifa. He tells him the story and then they go out. And as they're walking by the side of the road, he notices someone lying down under the shadow of a tree by the side of the road he's just lying down there wearing clothes like any poor peasant having no guards no escorts nothing around him no police officers no intelligence units no secret service with little earpieces washing around making sure no one approaches this high profile VIP Nothing. Just him lying under the shadow of a tree in the middle of the day. This Muslim man goes up to this individual. He says to him, Assalamu alayka ya Amir al Mu'mini. The Jewish man says, That is Amir al Mu'mini. That's him. How come he doesn't have any guards? He's in a state of war. He's got people trying to assassinate him, he's got agents working for his enemy trying to kill him. This isn't a utopian paradise. He's got no guards. The Muslim man looked at him. He said, shush. He doesn't even let his two sons, Hassan and Hussein, walk with him. He doesn't even let his closest friends go with him. He looked at him. He said, Adalta fatma'nant o Ali ibn Abi Talib. You were just, and that's why you feel safe. When a person is as just as Ali ibn Abi Talib, he's got nothing to fear. He's got nothing to fear except for a treacherous person who comes and attacks the Imam from behind while he's in the state of prayer. Otherwise, no one can face Ali ibn Abi Talib. How would you face him? How, would, how could you look into those eyes and raise your sword at him? So, that's the problem we have with that basic bare bones minimum level of connection with the Ahlul Bayt where it's just love, it's just emotion. And if that's all we have, then we will have to suffer the consequences of our sins. The second level of connection with the Ahlul Bayt is the level of Mushaya'ah, the level of being a Shia. Now, a lot of people confuse Al Mahabba with Mushaya'ah. A lot of people confuse love with fellowship, love with companionship, which is what Mushaya'ah means. And they confuse it because what they don't understand is that when you go on a funeral, in a funeral, in the Arabic language, they refer to funerals as what? Tashia. And a person who participates in funeral processions is called Mushayya. And the Mushayya, the reason these two terms are so close, Shia, Tashia, Mushayya, they're all stemming from the same root, which is that when you go to a funeral procession, you follow what? You follow the casket. You follow the coffin. You go around. Wherever the coffin's taken, you go with it. And you all do it collectively. You do it as one single unified body. So, to follow a funeral procession is to be a mushayya. And to be a follower of Ali ibn Abi Talib is to be a Shia. And yet we confuse our love for the Ahlul Bayt 
with imitating and following the other bait. It means you have to create a little, little miniature example of Ali ibn Abi Talib in you. Are you like that? I know I'm not. Do I really imitate him? The Imam himself says, Allah, wa innakum la taqdirun ala dhalik. In the statement that he made to his governor, he says to him, all I have is two pieces of clothing and all I have is two loaves of bread for food. That's it. And then he acknowledges the fact that this is too hard. He says, Allah, Allah is a means of emphasizing a reality. The Imam says, yes, I know. You cannot maintain the same, the same lifestyle as I do. Allah wa innakum la taqdiruna ala dhalik wa lakin a'inuni bi wara'in wa ishtihad wa affatin wa sadat. At least help me. Help me by trying, by being on the same path, by making a futile attempt. At least try so that on the day of judgment. Now, why would the Imam say a'inuni? This is something that made me think for a while. Why would the Imam need my help? In what? What exactly is he trying to do that he needs my help in doing it? And I thought the only possible explanation is the act of intercession on the Day of Judgment. The Imam is saying, you know what? We'll intercede for you. We'll come to your rescue. We'll help you. Shafa'a is something every Muslim believes in. But help me. Give me a hand. Give me an excuse. Show me something. Don't let me walk up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Ilahi Rabbi, this black-faced sinner of you wants to go to heaven. With what? Do something. That's why I love these fundraisers and these programs like the Pakistan Relief campaign that Brother Musa organized. And it's wonderful to see, I don't want to talk about this, but I think it's wonderful to see people participating in these, in these campaigns because what they allow us to do is to show you know, do, do your part. I mentioned to one of the brothers, he said that we have an issue with the IUS and donations and whatnot. And we have the same problem with the Ahlul Bayt channel. What I usually tell people is, you know what? Give anything. Don't give me 10 pounds or 20 pounds or 100 or 1,000. Give me one single pound. Because with that, what's going to happen is, on the day of judgment, you'll say to God, I did do something. I offered what little I could offer. وَلَكِنْ أَعِينُونِي بِوَرَعٍ وَاشْتِهَادٍ Wara meaning to, to refrain from being in places where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden us from being there and from, for, for, for us to be in places where Allah has commanded us to be there. وَعِفَّةٍ وَسَدَادٍ اشتهاد means, means to try, to, to toil, to make an effort. So, to be a Shia is to follow Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now, what's the benefit of being a Shia? We talked about the benefit of being a lover of the Ahlul Bayt, and that is that we don't get condemned to eternal damnation. The benefit of being a Shia is this. The Prophet himself says, Ibn Hajar al-Asfalani, who is a staunch enemy of the Ahlul Bayt and their followers, he's got a book by the name of As-Sawa'if al-Muhriqa fal-Raddi ala Ahl al-Bid'i wa zandaqa And he's really opposed to the, to the followers of the Ahlul Bayt. He himself narrates the hadith. In his book, he says, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ يَا عَلِي أَنْتَ وَشِيعَتُكَ عَلَى مَنَابِرَ مِنْ نُورِ مُبْيَضَّةً وُجُوهُهُمْ حَوْلِي فِي الْجَنَّةِ Oh Ali, you and your followers, your Shia, your true Shia, you are sitting on, on, a, on pulpits of light, on a pulpit that emits light, imagine that. عَلَى مَنَابِرَ مِنْ نُورِ مُبْيَضَّةً وُجُوهُهُمْ with white luminous faces while sitting around in a circular fashion around me in paradise. In other words, you're the closest people to me in paradise. That's what it means to be a Shia. And that's the benefit of being a Shia. Being a Shia means you are taken to paradise if you're a true Shia. You're taken to paradise with honor and grace and dignity with no questions asked. How do I say no questions asked? You followed Ali ibn Abi Talib. What question is there to be asked? That's a Shia. Is there a higher level? Of course there is. The higher level is the level of Mu'alat. And the level of Mu'alat, those who pray in a congregational prayer, when you pray collectively, they, when, when you pray behind an imam, they say, Tawalla al-imam. 
Mu'alat is to imitate the Imam in the exact manner and in everything he does. So the Imam gets up, you get up. The Imam sits down, you sit down. That's Mu'alat. But there is a greater meaning to Mu'alat. When you perform Mu'alat and you, 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 you fall into the category of a Wali of the Ahlul Bayt, Here's what's going to happen. There is a particular du'a that is recommended to be recited on Tuesdays. Du'a Yawm al-Thulatha. Look it up in Mafatiha al-Jilan or look it up online. It's a beautiful du'a. In it, we say the following. Allahumma ja'alni min hazbika fa inna hazbaka humul ghalibun. Allahumma ja'alni min awliya'ika fa inna awliya'aka la khawfun alayhim. وَلَاهُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Make me among your awliya. Let me try and explain what awliya means very briefly and move on. A father walks into his house and he notices that his son is a little pale. Immediately he's going to turn to his wife and say, has he been sick? His son sneezes twice in a row. And he wonder if, wonders if he's caught a cold. You know how fathers are. You know how mothers are. They could be a little obsessive compulsive sometimes. But that's what makes them so wonderful, isn't it? That's what makes them so beautiful. In fact, let me just open two parentheses here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look at the status of parents in Islam. The status of love and admiration and affection that needs to be shown to parents to the point that Allah says in his book that if they command you to become an infidel in other words if your parents have no respect to God the almighty creator of the universe at all they are kafir they're non-believers in fact they could even be disbelievers if there's such a term they're staunch atheists God says you take good care of them you hear that? take good care of your parents in other words, never mind their relationship with me. Never mind about that. That's not your concern. You take good care of them. Isn't that amazing? That's the level. There's a hadith that says one day a person walked by and he was a young man, a very muscular kind of individual, must have worked out 24-7, he comes across while the Prophet is sitting down with a bunch of his companions. Suddenly they look at this man. And it's like, you know, when you have somebody walking into the majlis and you've never seen the guy before, but you're impressed. Um, they all look at him and say, wow, you know, that dude looks pretty good. We wish, they say to the Prophet, we say, they say, we wish he'd come and join us in jihad while we go and combat the enemy. You know, he's got those abs and he's got that image that macho, cool dude kind of thing, why not invest that where it counts in jihad? You know what the Prophet said to them? He said, لَعَلَّهُ Maybe he's got two elderly parents that he helps and that he takes care of. And if that's the case, then that is better for him than performing jihad in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Isn't that amazing? And this is at a time when the Prophet needed soldiers. He needed people to come and help. And yet he was giving them an excuse not to come. Saying, you've got two elderly parents that need your help and assistance, stay with them. Even if those parents are kuffar, you take good care of them, you respect them. You never even say, oof. Which if you think about it, oof is, is one of the easiest expressions of, 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 of anger and discontent and, uh, that, that anyone can make. All you're doing is blowing out air. Oof. God said even this is unacceptable when it comes to parents. Because any expression of discontent, any expression of hate or anger, even looking at them in an angry way, looking at them in an angry way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that's wrong. We have a hadith saying that if, you, if one looks at his parents in a, in a loving, affectionate way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will consider that to be as a form of worship. So moving on. Wali in the Dua that I recited, Allahumma ja'alni min awliya'ika fa inna awliya'ika la khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun. Like a father who walks at home and he notices his son sneezing twice in a row and he says, has he caught a cold? 
The son has a slight temperature and the father runs to the ER. In short, what I'm trying to say is, a son with an affectionate father or mother like that, who all parents are with regards to their children, has nothing to worry about. True or not? He's got everything made for him. He's got everything going for him. He's got loving, affectionate parents that make sure he's clothed, make sure he's fed, make sure he's taken care of. When he's sick, they make sure they get the best medical treatment, even if it means giving from their own blood, giving their own kidney, losing their own lives for his sake. They'll do anything. That is a wali. What do they call a parent? A guardian. A guardian in Arabic is wali. When, when we say, oh Allah, make me among your awliya, what we're saying is, oh Allah, be my guardian. Why? Because your guardians have nothing to fear. There's nothing to fear for them. And they'll never be sad. They'll never be upset. Because you'll take very, very good care of them. Once they've become your awliya. Now if you've got Imam Zaman, as your wali, is there anything, absolutely anything that you'd be worried about? If, if you've got Rasulullah being your wali, the Ahlul Bayt being our awliya, there's nothing to worry about. There is a man who comes to Imam al-Jawad, alayhi salatu wasalam, he says to him, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, how do I wash away the disgrace that is my lineage. Why did he say that? His name was Sa'd. And he was a descendant of the Umayyads. A descendant of the accursed tree. The tree that has been damned in the holy book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's a descendant of the Umayyads. And so he's ashamed of that. He comes up to Imam al and says to him, Ya Abna Rasulullah, what do I do? How do I wash away this, this, this disgrace that I have? The Imam said to him, and I quote, Ya Sa'd. Oh Sa'd, this brothers and sisters is a level even higher than Tawalli. We have Hub, Tashayyu, Tawalli, what else? The level of being from them and among them. Oh Sa'd, Anta Amawiyun Minna Ahl al Bayt. You've got nothing to You're one of us. You are from the tree of Bani Umayyah. Your lineage has no bearing on who you are because you're one of us. Minna ahl al bayt. You're a member of the holy household. Imagine. The Imam called him Sa'dul Khair. And in one letter the Imam sent to him, he called him, he said to him, Ya Akhi, Ya Sa'd. Oh brother. And he's an Umayyad. Another example. Somebody delivers news to Amir al muminin The Imam was in the middle of the street. Suddenly the Imam began sobbing. There's a difference when you cry and there's like a little you know, tear that's coming down the side of, of your cheek. And when you begin to sob and lament in an open fashion, crying out loud, they, they walked up to the Imam saying to him, What's happened to you, Ya Amir al muminin What's this news that was delivered to you? He said, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr has just been killed. Muhammadun ibni min sulbi Abi Bakr. Waladi min sulbi Abi Bakr. Muhammad is my son, albeit from the lineage of Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr was his father. Asma bin Umais was his mother. But he's my son. He's like a son to me and I'm like a father to him. Now that's a level much higher than than love or affection or sentimental attachment or tashayyu or even tawalli. How does that happen? There's a man by the name of uh, Al Khadim. He was titled as the Khadim, though his name was uh, Khayyal. He sends a letter to, I believe, Imam Al Hadi alayhi salatu wasalam. He says to him, Sometimes. People come to me and they say to me, they give me khums and they give me alms and they give me the obligatory uh, religious taxes. And when they give me that money, they then ask for a portion to be given back to them. 
A lot of people do this. It's a practice many people do, even in this day and age. They go to the marja or the wakil and they give him a por- you know, they give him the khums and the zakat and whatever it is, and then they say, could I have a portion back, uh, either for myself or because I'm building a house or I'm getting married or I- I've got uh, poor family members that I want to support. So this person says to the imam that sometimes people come and ask me the same thing, and أَعْتَمِدُ عَلَىٰ رَأْيِي And based on my opinion, I judge and analyze their position and decide whether I should give them a little bit back. Because it's not his money. So what right does he have to give it back to them? He says, I judge and analyze their situation based on what you have taught me. And based on that, I either give them or do not give them. Is that okay? The Imam said to him, اعمل برأيك فإن رأيك رأيي ومن أطاعك فقد أطاعني You do what you think is best. For your opinion is my opinion. And whoever obeys you has obeyed me. This is not a Sayyid. He's not a member of the household of the Imam. He's not a descendant of the Prophet. He's a random person. But who whose acts were so compatible with the Ahlul Bayt, that the Ahlul Bayt say to them, that your opinion is my opinion. Imagine, this is, this is Hujjatullah ala al-Arz talking. In other words, the fact that the Imam is infallible, he's also somehow suggesting that this person is also infallible. That's what it means when he tells someone that whoever obeys you has obeyed me. In other words, you're as infallible as I am. In the sense that you do not commit sins and you do not go against the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not the general understanding of, of infallibility which is a status given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so how does that happen? I mean seriously I read these stories and I'm ashamed of calling myself a Shia I swear to God I feel nothing but shame I'm a Shia and Sa'ad al-Khayr is also a Shia whom the Imam calls Ya Akhi I'm a Shia and this Khadim is a Shia whom the Imam says, مَنْ أَطَاعَكَ فَقَدْ أَطَاعَنِي I am a Shia. What have we done? Brothers and sisters, we've, we've wasted our lives on a bunch of toys is what we have. It's a bunch of toys. What, what are we occupied with? Jewelry, mobile phones, gadgets, computers, a bunch of worthless junk. That's all. That comes and goes. And yet all our lives are revolve around these things. When we get a little older, the toys just get a little bigger, that's all. Now it's no longer about a mobile phone, it's about a car. It's no, it's no longer about a little doll that I play with and I sleep with at night. It's about a house. It's about a wife. It's about what I dedicate myself to. We mentioned and we spoke about the definition of slavery and what it means. We dedicate our lives and it's as though we exercise no control anymore. Something else is dictating what I should or shouldn't do. Where I spend my time, where I go, where I choose not to go. And yet I want to be a Shia, I want to be a person like Sa'd al-Khayr or Maytham al-Tammar. Maytham al-Tammar was crucified. And as he was hung on the tree with his hands nailed to it, they began smashing his face with an iron bar. And they smashed it so bad that they absolutely destroyed all of his teeth, they dislocated his jaw. His belly was slit from one side to other to the other. His guts were out. Why? Because he was calling out, Ya Ali. Ta'ala wa ayyuhal nas, asifu lakum Sayyidi wa Mawlai Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now that's a Shia. And I call myself a Shia. I can't even resist a Pathetic temptation. Music. I walk into a store and somebody asked me about music and its effects and whatnot. And I said to him, you know, suffice to say that music is one of the most powerful means of manipulating people's brains. He said, how? I said, they actually did a study that if you walk into a department store and they've got music playing, on average you end up staying longer than if there was no music playing in the background. Even though it's just background music. And most of us would say, I'm not even paying attention to it. I'm not listening to it. I'm hearing it. But it's background noise to me. Studies have shown that you spend longer when there is background music. What does that tell you? 
It tells you that the music is manipulating you. It's playing up with you. Why let yourself be manipulated? Why let yourself be victim to these things? Sometimes we do it in the name of Islam. Sometimes we do it with a somewhat pure intention, but, but in the process commit so many sins. I said to a brother, I said, God forbid you want to do something nice. For example, buy some perfume for your wife. You walk into that department store to the section where they, where they sell the perfume. You commit on average 780 sins while trying to do one good thing, one mustahab deed for your wife, which is in the form of giving her a perfume. With all the posters and all the pictures and all the things that are there. God forbid you want to do something halal. You want to do something mustahab and recommended. Yes, it gets to a stage where I think, you know what? To hell with the mustahabat. Let me just stick with the wajibat. I can't even do that. Not anymore. Not in this world. Forgive me, brothers and sisters. Let's be honest about these things. Oh no, I'm doing something. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, I'm doing these things. Alhamdulillah, I've got this occupation. Alhamdulillah, I'm doing this. And when you analyze it, when you put it under a microscope, a thousand sins are being committed every single day just because I'm trying to do something that eventually I say to Alhamdulillah. What Alhamdulillah? Na'udhu Billah is what I should say. We seek refuge, I swear, we seek refuge in Allah. Maytham al Tamar is that, Sa'dul Khair is this. Let me give you a couple of more examples and wrap up. Allam al Amini is the person who compiled the book Al Ghadir Fil Kitabi wa Sunnati wal Adab. It's a, an impeccable work of art. It's a masterpiece is what this book is. I don't believe it's been translated into, into English, maybe into Urdu. I know it's been translated into some other languages like Farsi. But the Arabic version of the book is just a masterpiece. And it deals with the event of Ghadir from all different perspectives, various different centuries. The author of the book, my father's met him. He's met him several times, Allam al-Amini. He was a Turk. He was from the city of Tabriz in northwestern Iran. And he spoke Arabic with a great deal of difficulty. And he had a very thick, very heavy Turkish accent. Right? And yet you read his book and it's like, I don't know, a professor of, of, of Arabic studies, the dean of the, of the, of the language department at, at university. It's, it's unbelievably flawless and, and eloquent and beautiful. The point is... He worked hard. In fact, he worked so hard to, to, to collect all these ahadith that he said to my father that one, one day I was told that there is one particular book that could be useful for my, for my research. And he read a hundred thousand books to compile this ten volume encyclopedic work. He says, one day I heard of a book. I looked for it. They told me there's only one copy left that we know of. And it's in a mosque in the city of Aleppo in, in Syria. So I packed up and left. He was in Najaf. He said, I left all the way to Aleppo where the location of the book, the alleged location of the book. I walk into the mosque. It's got a library and sure enough, the book was there. He said, I asked permission to take the book so I could copy it. They told me you can't take it. We're sorry. It's an old transcript and you can't have it. So he says, eventually I was forced to go to the town sheriff. Listen, that's how hard they had to work. He says, I went to the town sheriff, to the Mukhtar, they called him, uh, the, the chief of the tribe or whatever. And I said to him, I'd like to volunteer. He's a alim. He's a mushtahid from Najaf. What's he doing all the way in Aleppo? He says, I walked out to this person and I said to him, I'd like permission to go and be a janitor at this mosque so that I could have some time alone when people leave and I close down, I could then go to the library, take this book and copy it. They gave him permission. And I'm not saying being a janitor at a mosque is, is, a, is a dishonorable job or anything like that. It's just inappropriate for a alim of that caliber to go and spend six months cleaning the bathrooms in a mosque so that he could have access to this book. And within six months, he wrote the whole thing. He researched the entire library and he went back. What's the consequence? Let me just share one story with you. 
One of the ulama says, I saw Allam al-Amini in my dream. But the way I saw him was that it's as though I was in the middle of the desert of the Day of Judgment. I can see heaven on one side, hell on the other, and on the side there was the pond of Kotha. And Amir al muminin was there feeding the thirsty. He was quenching the thirst of his followers and his lovers by having a cup, filling it with water, and then feeding them. Suddenly I noticed that the Imam dropped everything and he ran towards the opposite side of the mahshar. I looked closely and it was Allam al-Amini. The Imam brought him close to the pond himself. He brought him close. Then he picked up some of the water with his own bare two hands and began feeding Allam al-Amini, saying to him, May Allah illuminate your face the way you illuminated mine, which means may Allah restore your honor the way you restored mine. May Allah dignify you the way you dignified me. May Allah help you the way you helped my cause. That's what happens when you become with them. When you become from them and among them. Can we do that? Seriously, can we reach that level? I mean, I, this is what I say to Amir al-Mu'mineen. Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. I'm not like that person who had Zoroastrian parents. He was born in a land of idolatry where they worshipped fire. His parents were Zoroastrian. He packs up, he goes to the Prophet, he becomes a companion. His, his name, you're all familiar with, Salman al-Farisi. The Prophet changed his surname to Muhammadi to say that you are one of us, Salman minna ahl al-bayt. You're not a Persian, you're not an Arab, you're not from the East or the West, you're from us. What happened? He dies in Madain. Madain is a place near Baghdad in Iraq. He dies there. Amir al muminin goes all the way from Kufa to Madain by teleportation. He goes to Madain, then the Imam prepares his body. He washes it. He wraps his body with a cloth, with the shroud. Was Ali ibn Abi Talib an undertaker, brothers and sisters? Was Ali ibn Abi Talib a person who buries the dead, who prepares the bodies of the dead? No. But when it comes to Salman, he's different. Then the Imam lowered him into his grave. Then the Imam himself went down into the grave. He placed his lips against the ears of Salman. And he said to him, you're going to a place where you will meet Rasulullah. Salman minna al bayt Can we be like that? Ya Amir al muminin Ya Rasulullah. Ya Allah. My parents were Muslims. My parents worshipped you. My parents were lovers of the Prophet and Ali ibn Abi Talib. And yet look how far we are. And how had they are. مَا لِي كُلَّمَا كَبُرَ سِنِّي كَثُرَتْ ذُنُوبِي Imam Zayl Abidin says in Dua Abu Hamza Thamari, Oh Allah, what's wrong with me? The older I get, the worse off I become. Can we be like that? The answer is yes. All it takes, and I'll conclude with this, is one commitment. One single genuine pledge that you make to turn around and say, I want to be a different person. This month of Ramadan in 2010, in 10 years time, in 50 years time, you look back and say, that represented my turning point. On that holy month, I changed and I became a better person. How does it happen? One split second decision was made by a man who turned against his tribe, he turned against his army, he turned against everybody and joined the ranks of Imam al Hussein to the point that the Imam saw him afterwards, looked at him while he was lying on the ground and he said to him, Antahurrun kama sammatta ummuk. You are as free as your, you are free just as your mother named you the free one. One commitment. Now I don't know. What was it that made Hur switch sides and embrace death? But perhaps it was the look he saw on the face of Imam al Hussein's six month old infant. The, the hadith says that Imam al Hussein held his infant in such a way 
by turning his face towards the enemy so they, so they could see the impression on the face of this infant. So they could see what he looked like after three days of not having any nourishment of any kind. After three days of having no milk and no water of any kind. The Imam sat on the back of the camel of Rasulullah. He approached the enemy while having his son in one hand and the copy of the Quran in the other. In other words, he's saying, I'm not here to fight you. I'm not sitting on the back of my horse. I don't have my sword. All I have is this little flower, this rose that I am showing to all of you. And in what state was Ali al-Azhar? Hadith tells us and historians tell us that he was yatalavva min shiddat al He was like a fish. When you take a fish out of the water, you throw it out and it has no water to breathe from. The fish at first jumps up and down. At first has a lot of movement. Eventually the fish settles down. It, cha- it, it shakes its tail, but that's about it. After a while you notice that the fish is dead. You get closer and you notice the fish isn't dead. It's moving its lips really, really slowly. And you know that this is the end. If you take the fish then and put it back in the water, it won't survive. It's already dead. That child of Hussein ibn Ali was already dead dead except for the fact that it was sticking its tongue he was sticking his tongue out of his mouth every once in a while signaling the fact that I want some water before I die. Abu Abdullah al Hussein took him to the enemy he said ala tanzuruna ila hadha al-tifl wa huwa yatalavva ashat atashan do you not see this child as he is dying of thirst then suddenly the child had no movement whatsoever. Suddenly the Imam noticed that his child was moving. He looked at him and there was a three-pronged arrow that had pierced through his neck. The Imam called out, What relieves the pain or what makes the pain easier is the fact that, oh God, you are seeing this, you are looking at this. Suddenly there was a call that was made in the heavens. Da'hu ya Hussein. Oh Hussein, leave him. It's over now. فَإِنَّ لَهُ مُرْضِعَةً فِي الْجَنَّةِ For he has a nurse waiting for him in paradise. There is a wet nurse that will feed him. He wasn't able to be fed in this world. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون إلهنا إنا نسألك وندعوك The hadith says if you call out the name of Allah ten times there will be a response from Allah saying, لَبَّيْكَ abdi sal amma badalak." Here I am my slave, here, here I am my servant. Ask for anything that you wish. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala بِحَقِّ فَاطِمَةَ وَأَبِيهَا وَبَعْلِهَا وَبَنِيهَا وَالسِّرِّ الْمُسْتَوْدَعِ فِيهَا Ya Allah Don't be shy, call out the name of Allah. Ya Allah, 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 أعوذ بجلال وجهك الكريم أن ينقضي عني شهر رمضان أو يطلع الفجر من ليلتي هذه ولك قبلي تبعة أو ذنب تعذبني عليه اللهم إن لم تكن قد غفرت لنا فيما مضى من شهر رمضان فاغفر لنا فيما بقي من We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all those who are sick, all those who have asked us for du'as and prayers, all those who are needy, all those who are destitute, all those who are in trouble, at this hour and at this minute and at this moment to relieve all of them بحق محمد وآل محمد 
and to cure those who are sick, especially Haj Abu Hassan and all of those who need our du'as. Let's all pray for them in the hope that Allah would relieve them and Allah would make them well on this very night, insha'Allah. And let's recite this verse uh, for uh, their well-being. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Amma yujibu al-mudhtar idha da'a wa yakshifu al-suh Amma yujibu al-mudhtar idha da'a wa yakshifu al-suh Amma yujibu al-mudhtar idha da'a wa yakshifu al-suh أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصل اللهم على محمد وآله الطاهرين